Welcome to AFSPA Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association with Chief Operating Officer Kyle Longton. Be sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast channel. Enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of AFSPA Talks. This is Kyle Longton with you once again, and today AFSPA Talks oversees second opinion. You may recall, if you've been a long-time listener to the podcast, that last October we did an episode with one of our partners from Pinnacle Care, which is a stateside um, expert second opinion program that we offer to our members. While they offer some limited support for members overseas, our flagship partnership has been with the Cleveland Clinic for many years to provide second opinions for our members overseas. I don't have to tell you all that medical cultures, medical facilities, access to medical care is different outside the United States. And when you're facing a major diagnosis or the prospect of um, a substantial treatment plan, such as surgery or chemotherapy, you may want some additional assurance that what you're doing is the right thing. And that is one of the motivating factors behind offering this program to our members. We've got two great guests with us today to talk to us about the program. The first is Peter Rasmussen, MD who currently serves as the Chief Clinical Officer for the clinic by Cleveland Clinic. He's also a professor of neurosurgery in the Cerebrovascular Center Department of Neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. He's the former medical director of digital health at the Cleveland Clinic, where he oversaw the clinic's overall digital health strategy and implementation of their digital medical platforms. He maintains a busy clinical practice offering patients either open microsurgery or endovascular minimally invasive treatment options. As the former director of the Cerebrovascular Center at the Cleveland Clinic, he founded the clinic's telestroke program, which has grown to more than 2,000 teleconsults per year, and he envisioned and implemented the clinic's mobile stroke treatment unit, one of the first two units in the U.S. He's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Medical School in Madison, Wisconsin, completed his residency in neurosurgery at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, completed fellowship training in interventional neuroradiology endovascular neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, as well as a fellowship in microsurgical treatment of cerebrovascular disease, also at the Cleveland Clinic. He is nationally and internationally renowned in his field. Susan Scott will be our second guest who you'll hear from a bit later in the podcast. She serves as the Director of Client Services of The Clinic by Cleveland Clinic. Susan is passionate about enhancing the healthcare experience through technology and innovation in service delivery and ensuring that everyone has access to quality care. Susan is a high-performing leader in national client management for The Cleveland Clinic. She's responsible for ensuring flawless implementations for their new clients and solutions, providing client-specific engagement strategies to drive engagement and maximize the value of the clinic solutions for our clients and members and delivering on client commitments through proactive consultative account management. I hope you enjoy our conversation today. Peter Rasmussen and Susan Scott, welcome to ASPA Talks. Thank you for having us. Pleasure to be here, Kyle. Great, well, today we're talking about second opinions and on this podcast, on a previous episode, we explored this topic, um, but we focused really on sort of stateside members. And today we're taking a focus on the needs of our members overseas. Peter, just to take us to, to sort of a, a starting point, why might someone seek a second opinion? Well, you know, Kyle, unfortunately, uh, many of us are, are going to be faced with health problems throughout our life. And it's not uncommon that uh, these may be serious. Uh, unfortunately, some of us are going to be diagnosed with cancer or heart disease or neurologic disease. And I think anyone uh, who is faced with a significant health challenge, it's natural for them to think, you know, how do I get the best care? Or am I getting the best care? And uh, we don't usually think about uh, where do I go to get the easiest care or the closest care or the least expensive care. It's natural to just think, I'm going to get the best care. And uh, fortunately, uh, there are a a number of very good health resources around the globe. And uh, one of them is the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, in this regard, we offer a second opinion uh, program uh, that really allows uh, 
members and patients, uh, people around the world to access the expertise of the Cleveland Clinic. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon, uh, depending upon where you get your care, uh, that the diagnosis may be incorrect. Uh, there may be uh, uh, problems um, understanding what the patient's symptomatology are. Uh, there may be failures in ordering the appropriate lab tests or the appropriate imaging tests to confirm the clinical suspicion. There can potentially be uh, errors in interpreting uh, lab tests or biopsy specimens or imaging uh, that may be obtained. Um, and then there can be a failure to integrate the information properly to arrive at the right diagnosis. And of course, even uh, when there is a good solid working diagnosis, uh, new information come may arise over time, which may cause a rethinking of the initial diagnosis uh, to refine it uh, moving forward. Even once there is a proper diagnosis made, uh, you know, there are a variety of different ways of treating a condition and or a caregiver or a provider or a physician, wherever they may be located, may not be up to date on the most state-of-the-art therapy. So in this regard, a second opinion really allows a person to access uh, a Cleveland Clinic expert to help them refine their diagnosis uh, and get on a state-of-the-art treatment pathway. And and I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think you've already hit on it, but you know, we've got members in almost every country around the world with as many different medical systems and medical cultures. Um, and is there anything you would add to what you've already said about um, the unique reasons why someone outside the United States might seek a second opinion? You, you talked about um, you know, emerging, emerging therapies and treatments. You've talked about maybe labs or certain imaging not being available locally and so forth. Are there, are there other reasons that you'd want to add to that? I mean, I think it's uh, really dependent upon uh, location. You know, if someone's uh, based in uh, Western Europe, uh, as an example, there's going to be good access to uh, high quality healthcare, uh, perhaps Australia, uh, certain areas of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, there's going to be high quality healthcare. But what we're, what we're finding is that there's variable quality, uh, either in diagnostic capability or imaging interpretation, uh, and in particular, pathological interpretation. So if someone has a question of perhaps um, a malignancy, a cancer, and a biopsy is taken, uh, the quality of that pathological interpretation uh, can uh, not necessarily be the highest quality. Uh, as part of our second opinion program, if a person has a question about a cancer diagnosis or another diagnosis that has had pathologic uh, biopsy specimens for we do offer reinterpretation of the specimens uh, if we can get those slides or access to that tissue. And what we're finding is in a fair percentage of time, the Cleveland Clinic pathologists who are all subspecialty trained and only review, review uh, single organ system uh, tissue specimens all day long, um, it's not uncommon that they change the diagnosis um, or uh, about a third of the time they will apply additional stains um, and molecular probes to those biopsy specimens to further uh, hone in the diagnosis. This is particularly important in cancer because based on the genetic composition uh, and or the exact subtype of the um, cancer that you're dealing with, uh, that may open doors to new treatment uh, or close doors to treatment that are not going to be uh, efficacious or work for the patient and they can avoid side effects. I think it's uh, fairly important um, if the geographic location where uh, patients are that really, uh, and they're facing a significant um, medical decision around things like cancer or the need for a significant surgery, it just makes sense to get a second opinion to know uh, that there's more than one doctor in agreement on what the best way is to proceed. Makes a lot of sense. And um, as you, you mentioned before, um, Cleveland Clinic, being a world-class facility and, and Foreign Service Benefit Plan has partnered with Cleveland Clinic to offer our members this virtual second opinion um, when they're overseas. Can you talk just a little bit, you talked about subspecialty training um, and, and things like that. Can you go a little bit more in detail about some of the unique capabilities that Cleveland Clinic offers? Yeah, you know, the Cleveland Clinic is a global health resource. Uh, so first of all, we, we have, um, facilities uh, around the globe. Uh, so obviously we have a heavy presence in Northeast Ohio where our main campus is located. Uh, we also have facilities in Florida and Weston. Um, 
we've just opened a hospital and outpatient facility in the United Kingdom in London. And uh, for about the past 10 years now or so, we have a significant presence in the Middle East in Abu Dhabi. And we really leverage the physician expertise uh, globally that exists uh, within the Cleveland Clinic. And we have access to around 3,500 to 4,000 subspecialty trained physicians. And our program makes every effort to match the member or the patient uh, directly to the best possible Cleveland Clinic expert. Uh, so as an example, I was just reviewing a patient this morning, uh, patient had breast cancer, um, she had had some molecular and genetic markers um, assessed as part of her evaluation. And she had specific questions around the genetics of her uh, breast cancer and what the best treatment options were available. And fortunately, we had, not only do we have breast uh, oncologists who uh, specialize in this, but actually specialize in that direct question, you know, how are the genetic factors and the family history related to prognosis and treatment decision-making. So we work very hard to try to bring the best possible expert uh, to the uh, member's question. You know, Kyle, uh, many of us are familiar with uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, and his book, Outliers. And, you know, in there, he talks about how uh, about 10,000 hours of practice uh, really need to be put into a particular thing really to become proficient and expert at it. And the way the Cleveland Clinic is structured uh, by allowing physicians to practice in these highly niche subspecialty areas, it's easy for us to get to this 10,000 mark so we can really kind of cross that threshold that uh, Malcolm has set to really be viewed as uh, an expert on things. And this is the kind of expertise I think patients deserve when they're looking at a complex medical condition. We haven't discussed this before, but I'm curious if, if one of the um, specialists or um, subspecialists comes across this particular um, diagnosis and is aware of something like a clinical trial or research study, are they able to, to inform our members about that and, and particular opportunities for them to, to learn more about and, and participate in research on their um, diagnosis? Yeah, absolutely, Kyle. So first off, uh, Cleveland Clinic has experts in essentially every disease and every process, every organ system. It's both adult and pediatrics. And um, uh, when we are dealing with um, particularly complex problems or perhaps uh, difficult situations, you know, perhaps uh, late stage cancer or something like this, uh, we, we work very hard to try to offer uh, patients uh, some options uh, that may not be available locally. So for instance, that could be a, a different chemotherapeutic regimen that may be considered cutting edge. Um, and of course, if there's clinical trials that are available for patients, whether it's for uh, oncology or other surgical uh, specialties, like perhaps cardiac valve disease, something like this, uh, we do offer patients uh, clinical trials. Obviously, if uh, that's the direction the patient wants to move, that usually then does require transition to in-person Cleveland Clinic care. As I mentioned, we've got many options around the world, um, Abu Dhabi, London, uh, Weston, Florida, and Ohio. Um, and we make that transition to in-person care very easy because the medical records that we acquire as part of the second opinion process are incorporated into the global Cleveland Clinic electronic health network. And that includes the imaging um, and the pathology reinterpretation that our experts do. So wherever a, uh, a patient or a member may choose to get in-person care from Cleveland Clinic, that information is already incorporated into it. Uh, and we assist that member uh, in obtaining that in-person uh, appointment. Well, and I appreciate you talking about transitioning just from the diagnosis stage. Um, some members who are facing a serious diagnosis and seek a second opinion will end up returning to the States or accessing our other support programs during their treatment. Um, and so to best support our members utilizing this program, you know, the process begins with contacting our FSBP clinical team with a brief description of the medical situation they're facing. And then our clinical team will provide a link to a secure portal to start uploading things to um, the Cleveland Clinic. Peter, what should a member be prepared to upload in that moment? You've talked about a variety of things, but I'm wondering if you could review them here. Yeah, we, we really like a, a summary document of the um, patient's uh, concern or recent complaint. 
Uh, so if let's say this might be something around um, a cardiac problem, maybe a, a cardiac valve issue, something like this. Uh, it's terrific to get a medical record from perhaps a local cardiologist or a medical physician around this. Uh, and then imaging, any imaging studies that may be relevant. Uh, so that includes x-rays, CT scans, MRI scans, maybe echocardiograms or angiograms that might have been obtained locally. And of course, we prefer the images ourselves to, have, uh, to allow our experts to be able to review those uh, studies. Uh, it's not uncommon that we uh, differ in our interpretation of what happens um, uh, locally. And it's also, as I mentioned, if there's biopsy specimens available, we also prefer to get those uh, samples as well, if the local law allows for those uh, tissue samples to be uh, sent to uh, Cleveland for our reinterpretation. Uh, of course, we prefer the medical records to be uh, in English. Uh, that obviously speeds the time uh, to uh, delivery of the opinion that we don't have to worry about um, any translation uh, of those documents. Of course, if there's any lab tests that are available, uh, blood tests or anything like this, uh, those things are uh, wonderful to have as well. Excellent. Excellent. And I am going to keep my camera off for right now because I am having some trouble with our internet connection. Um, so, Peter, what happens next once, once that, all, that, that perfect file, let's say, is, is uploaded, or at least the complete file that the, the member has is uploaded? What's the next step? What happens next at Cleveland Clinic? So for every case, the uh, uh, experienced uh, clinical nurse care manager will review the medical records that are there and understand what the members or patients' concerns are and questions are. And then based on that summary of that information and the requests, we try to match the, as I mentioned, the patients of the best Cleveland Clinic expert. Most of the time, the nurses are able to do that. Uh, sometimes if the request is a little bit unusual, they will enlist my uh, support or uh, another one of our clinical experts is support to match that patient to the best Cleveland Clinic expert. Once that Cleveland Clinic expert has the records, usually a written opinion can be formulated uh, in less than 48 hours. Uh, this is a fairly concise document and that is shared back to the patient to help them understand the next set of recommendations uh, that may be made or perhaps a change in the diagnosis. And that uh, document is usually also suitable for them to share with their local physicians. That's excellent. Um, and, and Peter, looking at the overall program, can you share any statistics you have on the results and outcomes for all people who use the program? Um, you know, any changes in diagnosis or treatment, anything like that? Yeah, what we're finding, Kyle, is that about a third of the time or a quarter of the time, uh, our Cleveland Clinic experts uh, have a different opinion on what the diagnosis is. So it could be something dramatic, uh, perhaps where the patient was told locally that they had a cancer and our pathologists reinterpret the specimen and it's really just an inflammatory condition. Obviously, this has had major considerations yeah. for patients to you know, avoid something like a major cancer surgery or chemotherapy. Uh, and that's not uncommon actually in pediatric malignancies where inflammatory states in kids can often be misinterpreted as being a cancer with obviously grave consequences. Um, and then even if the diagnosis we agree with, about three quarters of the time, we feel that there's a different uh, or perhaps better treatment strategy that might be employed. Many times this is a fairly dramatic. It might be avoiding a major surgery, or perhaps a physical therapy might uh, be more, are more appropriate for the patient as opposed to some type of orthopedic surgical procedure, or it might be a different chemotherapeutic regimen than what's being proposed uh, locally for a cancer. Uh, it might be something like switching from a open heart surgery to a minimally invasive surgery or a catheter-based procedure to address a cardiac uh, condition. Uh, overall, about a third of the patients that we see through this second opinion uh, decide to transition to in-person care at a Cleveland Clinic facility. So it really can have dramatic impact uh, on patients. Uh, by having a patient seek out that subspecialty niche expertise uh, really allows the patient to get the uh, access to the best possible care. And it doesn't always require a transition to in-person care if our recommendations are different. 
because frequently the recommendations from a Cleveland Clinic physician can be implemented locally as well. Thank you very much. That That is um, fantastic. And I think it, it matches up with what people might expect when they see seek a, an expert um, opinion. But uh, Peter, I want to I want to turn actually now to, to Susan, because uh, Peter, I appreciate your expertise, but it is both too broad and too specific. Um, your clinical expertise is, is very specific, of course, and your, your understanding of the program very broad. But I want to know about what FSBP patients, um, what their experience has been. And Susan, I think you've got the, the stats on this. Um, can what can you tell us about our membership, even just looking back over the last year? I know that the, the partnership's been in place for many years, but we were just looking at 2021. Are there, there outcomes or stats that you can share with us? Absolutely. So Kyle, looking back at 2021, uh, which would be looking at the calendar year, we actually had 67 FSBP members that utilized the Second Opinion Program resulting in 78 second opinions being delivered. So that means we had a number of people that had more than one second opinion provided. So it might be that they had multiple, <coughs> physicians, multiple physicians looking at the same diagnosis, or it might be that they had um, multiple episodes occur where they wanted to have the expertise of a Cleveland Clinic physician uh, review that diagnosis or treatment plan. Um, when we look at the uh, average age of the individuals using the program specific to FSVP, um, the average age was 41 years, uh, but we did see a distribution really across all age groups uh, with the members that were utilizing the program. And the turnaround time that we saw from the time that the member uploaded all of their member records to the time that the written opinion was delivered via the platform was 3.6 days, which is really industry leading. Certainly when somebody is facing a, a diagnosis or a treatment plan, they want to be able to get those answers as, as quickly as possible and, and get that peace of mind and confidence regarding their next steps. So we're very proud of the results that, that we had for FSBP with the, with the turnaround times. That's great. So that's really the kind of the demographic and some of those stats. When we look at the, the types of conditions for those 67 members, um, if we look at kind of the top three categories, I would say that musculoskeletal was the top based on volume, followed by uh, OBGYN, women's health, and then uh, digestive. That really rounds out the top three when we look at conditions. But there really was a, a pretty broad spectrum of the types of conditions that came through the program. We also saw respiratory, dermatology, ophthalmic, um, head and neck, neurological, neurological. So, you know, really the gamut is, as Peter had mentioned, you know, there really isn't a diagnosis that the Cleveland Clinic does not have the expertise to, to review. Sure, that, that is fantastic. Um, and, and it's a little bit different, I think, that what some of the, the diagnoses we're seeing from our overseas members versus our stateside members using a different program where we always see cancer is number one or number two there, mm. it sounds like that things were a bit more distributed and that, that's good. We want people to use this program. We want our members to use this program for what their, their serious needs are. And um, that's why we have it in place. And yep. I'm sorry, Susan, I think you might've touched on this. Um, can you remind me again, how many saw a diagnosis change and how many saw the treatment change? 82% of the second opinions resulted in a change in their treatment plan, and 17% of the second opinions had a change in their diagnosis as a result of the Cleveland Clinic review. Wow. So a little a little above the, the whole program average when it comes to, to treatment changes, but a little below in terms of diagnoses, um, and that's, that is great um, that, that they have access to this. Um, Susan, thank you very much because I, I this program is great, but I know our members always love hearing specifically about our membership, and it's so great to have those um, those stats. 
before we wrap up, Susan, is there anything more that you'd like to add about um, the program or our, our the specific um, partnership with FSVP and Cleveland Clinic? Thanks, Kyle. I would just remind members that as we move forward here in 2022, the importance of going through uh, the clinical team at the FSVP plan to initiate their second opinion and that they'll get an authorization from that clinical team via email that they can upload onto our platform when they access the second opinion through the link. Um, that will give us what we need in addition to their medical records to move forward knowing that they've been authorized by FSBP. That's excellent. And stay tuned at the end of the episode, I'll include the specific details of how to do that. Um, and Peter, any final words um, or thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah, uh, thanks, Kyle. Two things. Uh, first off is that, you know, people should not feel bad about seeking a second opinion. Sometimes there's this feeling that maybe they're cheating on their a local provider or a local doctor, uh, but you know, don't feel that way. Uh, I mean, this happens all the time, um, and doctors uh, consult other doctors all the time uh, to help get their opinion about a case. And most patients don't even know about it, uh, so that don't feel bad about it. And the second thing is, uh, even if you were to go through a process like this for a second opinion, and uh, we don't change the uh, diagnosis and we don't change uh, your treatment plan. Uh, you can move forward with uh, your local care with a greater degree of confidence, knowing that another physician and or a world expert uh, agrees with what's happening locally. And that can be very comforting for people moving forward. Absolutely. And that, that's a fantastic point and a great place to end it. Um, the, just reinforcing the whole idea here is to give our members greater confidence in their diagnoses and with the treatments that they're facing. So please, if you're listening, if you're overseas, um, and, and you find yourself facing a major diagnosis, um, please don't hesitate to take advantage of this program. Um, the, the experts are there. I think, Peter, remind me again, 3,500 um, different subspecialties. More than 3,500, that's right. All right. So they are, they are ready to, to support you in your time of need. And I want to thank Peter and Susan for joining me today in my time of need to learn more about this program and share more information with um, our members Thank you all very much. And thank you for the long and successful partnership in supporting the health of the Foreign Service Benefit Plan members overseas. Thank you, Kyle. To request a virtual second opinion for treatment received outside the United States, simply email secondopinion at aetna.com. You may be asked to submit medical history and answer questions specific to your diagnosis. You will also, also may need to gather information from your local physician or hospital such as pathology or biopsy slides or imaging, and be able to upload them to the site when instructed to do so. For more information, visit our website at afspa.org slash FSVP slash overseas and click on virtual second opinion or look at the 2022 FSVP brochure. This has been AFSPA Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association. All information offered in this podcast is meant to be educational. The views expressed by the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily represent AFSPA. Should there be any discrepancy between information offered in this podcast and official plan documents for the Foreign Service Benefit Plan or other products offered by AFSPA, the policy provisions will prevail. Thank you for listening and be sure to subscribe to Ask for Talks to catch our next episode. Please rate and review us on your favorite podcast app and share feedback with us on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn.